Welcome to Oh God, What Now? I'm Dorian Linsky. On today's show, Jeremy Hunt has delivered what will almost certainly be his final budget. Is it a vision for the country or just rolling the ground for an election campaign? Plus, we're joined by the BBC's disinformation and social media expert, Mariana Spring, to talk about her new book and the proliferation of conspiracy theories. And in the extra bit for supporters, we'll discuss the mainstream conspiracy theory that obsesses Liz Truss and Donald Trump, the spectre of the so-called deep state. Let's meet the panel. First up, Zoe Grunewald is a political correspondent for The Independent. Hi, Zoe. Hello. Um, you've just been coming from budget land. Mm, busy day. <laughs> busy day. Yeah. You also wrote in the paper that the terror threat in the UK is as high as it's been since 9-11. Is the government's planned new definition of extremism a direct response to that or purely political and to do with, for example, uh, Gaza protest marches? I think there are some genuine security concerns about the increased level of threat to MPs, to the public. I mean, last time, whenever you know, there's a correlation between when there's some conflict around the world, especially in the Middle East, you de- tend to get the terror threat pushed up here in the UK. But I think there's also a reason why this story, which was originally leaked to the Mail on Sunday, has come out. And it's part of this big campaign that we've seen from Rishi Sunak, from um, Conservative MPs to talk a lot about the threat of extremism, to talk a lot about conflict, a lot about um, the issues around MPs. And, you know, it puts puts Starmer in a corner to some extent because it highlights the sort of Israel-Palestine issues. But it also gives, I think, Sunak a new kind of culture war front to fight on, which is that we Mm. really need to clamp down on this threat, this threat of violence in the streets. Um, And, you know, in this story, actually, it was a lot of kind of anonymous conservative sources talking about, oh, you know, the, the terror threat level is really high. And I'm, I'm sure there are genuine concerns, but I do think it's quite politically advantageous to talk a lot about this as well. Next, popping in from our sister podcast, Paper Cuts, it's journalist and author John Elledge. Hi, John. Hello. Nice to be here. Uh, we just had Super Tuesday in the US, primaries or caucuses in 15 states, plus the territory of American Samoa. Uh, to nobody's surprise, Biden and Trump won almost all of them, uh, each lost one. Do the numbers tell us anything about the election, enthusiasm for the relative candidates? I mean, they tell us we're on for the most dis- de- depressing presidential election in many years, which is really saying something, um, because it's just going to be a repeat of the last one. Um, I mean, Trump won almost everything. I think Nikki Haley won Vermont, which is, if you're a Republican, entirely irrelevant anyway, because that's obviously going Democrat. Um, the the the. Her campaign did try to sort of say, like, that the, the, some of her numbers suggested a lack of enthusiasm for Donald Trump in some quarters, uh, and she did win a few delegates, but she then did drop out of the race earlier to, earlier on on Wednesday. So and, <laughs> and Biden lost American Samoa to businessman Jason Palmer. Is this a thing? It's amazing, isn't it? My favourite thing about this story is like he is quoted all over the press saying that he only found out when his phone started buzzing. He hadn't even been following the election in American Samoa. Uh, it was just when his mates started texting him, telling him he won. Uh, he won by fifty votes to forty-one, and it just sounds like he spent a lot of time Hang on, on Zoom. Wait, what? There were only ninety-one. In my, I think it was a caucus. I think so. There were only ninety-one votes. Um, he, it just sounds like he spent a lot of time on Zoom calls talking about his plans for education in the Pacific Islands. So it's probably not a game changer. I don't think he's going to be the nominee, no. And finally, I guess this week is the BBC's first ever disinformation and social media correspondent. You may well be aware of her excellent documentaries and podcasts. Now she has a book out, Among the Trolls, My Journey Through Conspiracy Land. It's Mariana Spring. Hi, Mariana. Thanks for having me. Hello. Thanks for having me. So there's always conspiracy news. Um, Recently, the independent MP Andrew Bridgen's wife told the Sunday Times how she had basically lost him to conspiracy theories. And what she describes sounds a lot like a religious cult, the rejection of friends and family for a new community. I mean, how common is that pretty extreme experience? I think it's a lot lot more common than people think. I mean, I get Endless messages from uh, people who have a friend or a family member, someone who's really fallen deep into conspiracy theories. And when we're talking about conspiracy theories here, we're not talking about legitimate concerns, questions people might have. Um, You know, politicians do bad things and people feel upset about that. And Mm. that is very different from belief in these very extreme conspiracy theories, often suggesting that almost everything is staged or a hoax or that that kind of thing is just you know, the really the really kind of most hardcore conspiracies, I'd say. Um, and the experience that Andrew Bridgen's wife described matches up, I mean, totally tallies with what I've been hearing, I think, for the past 
three years really from people who say, you know, there's someone I know and I didn't really realise they were vulnerable to this stuff. They dip their toe in conspiracy land, as I often call it, this kind of world of conspiracy and trolls and all sorts and became increasingly entrenched in their views and drawn into this community, this cult-like community where everybody constantly kind of reaffirms what you think and then often builds on that. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, there are lots of questions, not just for the people who perhaps lead those conspiracy theory communities and pull people in and isolate them from their real lives and the people in them, but also the social media companies and the way that, you know, you can often see it if you look at different people's timelines on X or um, their social media profiles, you, you get a glimpse of how in real time they've started to descend deeper down what we often call this rabbit hole. Until now, everything is very topsy-turvy and it becomes quite difficult to talk to them about it. Britain sent a letter to the Metropolitan Police demanding an investigation into pandemic policies. Um, the list of signatories must have read to you like Live Aid of anti-vaxxers, right? Like all the big <laughs> <No>. names. <laughs> well, it was. I actually, I was looking at that earlier and I was thinking, I was like, oh, yep, yeah, no you, no you, yeah, no yeah. you. Um, that's the thing, though, and I think it's important to think about it like this. This almost like parallel universe in some ways, uh, you know, a place where there are different doctors and different politicians that you like and different celebrities, so to speak, and different, you know, it's, it's, it is like a kind of separate world and there's they have their own conspiracy theory newspapers and they have their own media channels that they consume and, and even their own kind of holiday homes that are only meant for people who are within this community and wow. will go there. So th there is this kind of whole, th and that's for the very, very committed people. Some people will only kind of venture to the edges of conspiracy land. Um, but yeah, there, there are people who've grown pretty significant platforms, many of which were were on that letter that Andrew Bridgen wrote, um, who've been, you know, accused of spreading, again, some very extreme examples of disinformation. Some who've trolled me. I was actually going through, I was like, oh, yeah, he's trolled me. He's trolled me. He's trolled me. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, quite common when you do this job. <laughs> well, it's it's great that we've got epidemiologist Matt Letizier to <laughs> Oh, I'm blocked by Matt Letizier, in. actually. <laughs> which is a real shame. <laughs> Let's begin. For probably the last time, Jeremy Hunt has revealed what's inside his big red box of tricks. Uh, firstly, Zoe, why was the Commons so rowdy? The deputy speaker was being very sassy. There was loads of kind of like sort of shouting and a hollering. Mm. She told them to shout more quietly at one point, I think, which was uh, quite a funny <laughs> line. Um, yeah, it was particularly rowdy. And I think it's because we've really been building up now to what a lot of MPs think is going to be either the penultimate or the last big financial statement before a general election. Um, John and I were arguing about this the other day, actually, when we think the general election is going to be. And I actually think you're probably right after hearing that budget, John, January, that it, gonna it's going to be later um, because it didn't feel to me like a pre-election budget. There were tax giveaways for sure, right. but there was lots of sort of seeding the ground for other things they want to do. Um, there was talk about income tax, there was talk about further national insurance tax cuts. Um, and there was definitely a sense that although there was a bit of fighting talk there, I reckon the next budget or the next statement, you would see Jeremy Hunt give it a little bit more welly, be a little bit punchier. Right, because it's the last March budget, but mm. there's always the autumn statement. Autumn statement as well. And of course, yeah. Financial fun. Exactly. Um, so I think, I, I don't know if it will be January, but I think it may well be October. You know, they've been talking a lot about the second half of the year. But I think basically what you have now is you have um, the Labour Party who pretty much feel like they're the government in waiting. You know, they are so keen to jump down the Conservatives' throats to say what they have as an alternative. And of course, they want to put a lot of pressure on the government to look like they're walking into an election so they can say, oh, you bottled it when it come, you know, come May. So I think they were all treating it like it could be the last big dance of what the Conservatives actually have to offer. And we know that the economy, taxes, this, this is all the Conservative lifeblood. So it really mm. is the last chance to really attack the Tories on what they often see as their, their main selling point. Um, so you had a lot of um, shouting from the Labour benches, a lot of shouting back from the Conservative benches. I think what you're really getting a sense of is not only is this a fight for whether the Conservative Party are going to do what they say they are, but also the Labour Party preparing to sort of lash back at them. Um, can I ask you just about the weirdness of budget coverage? Mm. Because I think, I'm, I hope I'm not getting the history wrong here, but apparently like I think Herbert Morrison, was he uh, at least Chancellor, um, basically pre-announced one line from his budget speech and had to resign uh, in, in, the, in the 40s. Um, not the case now. Um, <laughs> the trailer is much longer than the film. Um, why is this happening? And is it good for us if basically 
pretty much everything is out there and being analysed before he, he says anything? It's a good question, because on the one hand, you could argue that it's actually maybe we shouldn't just be having, you know, a spring statement and an autumn statement and actually government should be much more sort of adaptive and consultory with the public about their, you know, their fiscal policies. But on the other hand, it does lead to this very irritating dance over the few months beforehand of just things being briefed and then being taken back when public opinion moves against it or the OBR or the IFS. Um, And I think a lot of it is... Um, well, I personally think the Conservatives were trying to do a lot or the Conservative government was trying to do a lot to show backbenchers that they were moving in a direction of tax Mm. cuts. So obviously there was a lot of talk around uh, the by-elections about uh, whether Rishi Sunak was leading them, you know, to a devastating um, electoral uh, blowout. But actually, I think they really wanted to show we are going to try and cut cut taxes and please bear with us. Um, But I think also it's just another kind of symptom of having this sort of 24-7 news media where you have lobby journalists constantly trying to find things out ahead of time, trying to get the most recent budgets group. I mean, I think it was 2p national insurance tax cut, then 1p national insurance tax cut, then 2p, then 1p, and now back to, and now we know it's 2p. And I don't know if that's particularly helpful and whether that's just the Treasury knocking around some ideas and coming to it or whether that's deliberately briefed out to see what will stick and what will not. It's kite flying, isn't it? Yeah. They're they're seeing how unpopular or popular certain measures are going to be. Mm. It bothers me slightly that we talk about only about the politics of it and the economic and not the economics because technically it's a, an economic thing mm. um but is that a fair actually just a fair reflection of the reality of this that you know the likelihood is that they're not going to be governing for very much longer and that long term economic strategy is far less important than short term political maneuvering and so therefore that the coverage by seemingly focusing too much on the westminster of it all mm. is actually a fair reflection of what it is well i think there's a few things i mean the first is that most of your coverage comes from lobby journalists who are political journalists and not all very well versed well versed on the uh, economics of it all so that obviously makes the coverage um slightly more political in tone but i also think there's something to be said about this particular budget which is is very very political because a we're heading into a general election and b the government don't have a lot of economic headroom in and so what they are doing is really, you know, last chance saloon, tax cuts. I mean, to fund their tax cuts, they were literally doing tax rises in other areas just so workers would feel the benefit because they mm. want to win around those voters. So, I mean, and then you also have the government self-imposed fiscal rules. You have the Treasury basically being very Treasury brained and saying no to anything long term. So ultimately, what you do get is quite a short termist political budget often because there isn't really that scope, that thinking, whether that be in the media, whether that be in the Treasury whether that be in the short-term um, nature of our elections that allow these kind of more long-term, economically sound budgets. I mean, they are political, I think. Uh, John, what was the big news? Were there any um, any bangers? I mean, it was hit after hit after hit, really, <laughs> wasn't it? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the biggest one by any reasonable definition is the National Insurance Cut, which is... We have this weird thing where we have sort of multiple different taxes on income, but it is effectively a two pence cut in mm. taxes on income, even though it's not the thing we call income tax. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's quite significant, especially when added to the two pence that came off in November, which made absolutely no difference to the polling. But, you know, there's no reason not to try again, I suppose. <laughs> um, there was also oh, one other thing about that, actually, is there was some 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 of the analysis I heard earlier that is worth five times as much if you earn over 50K than if you earn under 20K. Like, that is quite a big tax cut for the middle classes, which is quite useful if you are the middle classes. They were talking about cutting inheritance tax, but that didn't happen. No. I mean, why? I mean, my yeah, I, I don't have any inside information. My guess would be following up on what Zoe was saying, that like they sort of tried talking about this in public to see what the reaction was. Mm. And the reaction was, are you completely insane? Like you're, you're 20 points behind in the polls. Everyone thinks you're the party of the rich. Why at this point would you want to be cutting taxes for millionaires? There was a lot of objection from Red Wall MPs, I think, who felt that tax cuts for the wealthy in the form of inheritance tax would go down pretty badly in there constituencies. Oh, so it's a tax cut for the South East, isn't it? Mm. Because effectively, like, estates that are paying inheritance tax are overwhelmingly sort of relatively expensive houses, which are very much concentrated at this end of the country. So when I turned on uh, the budget, I missed the beginning, um, sadly. Um, (laughs) Jeremy Hunt was actually talking about tax relief for the arts, for theatres, and I was just like, oh, this is, this sounds quite good. It was extending the tax relief um, from the pandemic. 
So was there, um, I mean, obviously, then there were other bits I didn't like. <laughs> um, was there anything else that you, you just thought, oh, well, this is just, this is just good? I mean, I think they've, I, I don't, I haven't quite got my head around the details, but they've removed a cliff edge in the payment of child benefit. I think for sort of like if you're sort of you know a, re a reasonably high earning but not incredibly rich household, there was a point where they start taking your child benefit away, so so your marginal tax mm. rate goes through the roof. Uh, they've I don't mean they've removed that entirely, but they have sort of pushed it up so that it it affects far fewer people. That is obviously a pre-election thing, because it is a tax cut for the sort of households that in normal times probably would be voting Tory and are currently not. But nonetheless, that is like a weird thing about the tax system that that probably needed sorting out. I think that's quite good. What do you think, Zoe? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think, um, yeah, I think that was that was a good thing. Um, obviously, they well, we'll talk about it, but they nicked Labour's non dom policy oh, yes. as well to fund some of this, which is going to cause its own political headaches for Labour. But for a lot of people, that feels like quite a uh, quite a good loophole to close if it gives you a couple of extra bill. Right. So they did they did basically did a Labour policy, um, but then immediately spent the money on tax cuts. Um, <laughs> how bad is that <laughs> for um, for Labour? You know, when they go, we'll have to find the money from somewhere else, whereas Rachel Reeves' whole thing seems to be not finding the money from mm. somewhere else. Well, I rushed here from the Labour lobby briefing, actually, and uh, the uh, Labour Party spokesman had a great big grin on his face in a kind of holding it together kind of way rather than a oh, right. this is all going to be totally fine. <laughs> um, he wouldn't give away too much. He basically said that Labour is still committed to all the things they said they would fund from the non-don tax thing. Um, so that includes uh, breakfast clubs, it includes uh, money for the NHS. But when pushed about where that money would now come from, they said, well, well, we'll kind of have to get back to you on that, essentially. They're still saying that they don't intend to raise taxes, but without kind of raising taxes further or without cuts to public spending, it's really hard to see how they will claw back that money. Now, there's a lot of talk, and there was a lot of talk in the budget today about public sector productivity savings, so kind of making public services work quicker and more efficiently. But I, th I can't remember how much it was that uh, Jeremy Hunt said he would be able to claw back from that. I mean, it was quite a considerable amount. I think that's quite optimistic. That's the efficiency fairy, isn't it? Yes. So I, I, I think um, Labour will probably be feeling very frustrated by that. But this is a really great example why, of when people say, why aren't Labour telling us anything? This is why you shouldn't <laughs> say an awful lot before your <laughs> manifesto, because yeah. the government will not only use it if it's good, they'll use it to, to piss you off as well. <laughs> Uh, how did Sama respond? I did not. Uh, I did not stay tuned for that. There were lots of great lines from uh, Starma. One of the best ones was he called uh, Sunak and Jeremy Hunt the Chuckle Brothers of Decline. He was basically saying that uh, Jeremy Hunt has come in here and talked about how the economy is turning a corner, growth is improving. Meanwhile, working people are feeling the cost of living still. They're remortgaging. They're going to have these huge council tax rises, you know, all these things that are just not being factored into this budget. He basically called the budget deluded. Um, he pointed back to um, other things that the Conservatives have done. He pointed back to Liz Truss's mini budget. He talked about the Rishi recession. You know, he was basically just saying none of this really stacks up with reality and the reality of voters. Now, again, he, there were some things they said they supported. They supported... Um, uh, the cut to national insurance, obviously, they they uh, support the non-don tax loophole closure as well, although they say it's a terrible U-turn uh, from the Conservative government to, to steal their policy there. But I think essentially, again, you can see that Labour aren't going to reveal too much way of their own policy now because they've kind of been burned. They'd rather point to all the failures that led up to this point, the fact that they're presiding over stunted growth, higher debt, and say, you know, would you really trust this Conservative government with your money for another four years? Well, I imagine... Imagine that the Conservative press tomorrow will have a picture of uh, Jeremy Hunt laughing at one of his own jokes and like a headline like, we're in the money <laughs> or, you know, good times are here mm. again. Um, but my suspicion is that the government is in the state now where they could literally bribe people at the polling station gates and it wouldn't help. Mm. Like, do you imagine that there will be any kind of uptick off the back of this? Uh, for Conservative Party mm. support? Um, well, we didn't see much at the autumn statement. You know, we didn't see the polls move at all after the 2% national insurance cut. I mean, I think, you know, maybe the cumulative impact and people feeling it and seeing it in their paychecks for a few months might be quite helpful. Um, I think John was right pointing to the, the, 
the child benefit thing as well. But I think, you know, you also have to remember this government presided over the, the previous 14 years of <laughs> economic circumstance. And I don't think people just forget that because they're saying, oh, we've turned a corner now. You know, Jeremy Hunt was saying, when when we when me and Mishy Sudak came into government, inflation was at 11%. And it's like, yeah, but who were your predecessors? <laughs> you know, I don't think people just forget that and think, oh, I'm so glad they fixed that. They've done the right thing. I think that yeah. stuff still follows. But Rishi Sunak seems so constantly irritated that he's being held responsible for the sort of 12 <laughs> years before he was there. Just like, I don't know these people. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention that he was Chancellor, of course, as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, John, if you're looking at the economic situation in Britain at the moment, obviously cost of living, there's a massive uh, funding crisis for local councils, them going bankrupt left, right and centre and, and loads more to come. There's not enough money for the, the court system is struggling, street homelessness is going up, um, local public services are dreadful. Was there anything, apart from the efficiency fairy, about the fact that the country needs money in order to function? Not that I spotted. There was some talk about there was devolution settlements, but like those are always like I'm quite in favour of devolution. Don't get me wrong, but they do tend to come with figures attached where you just think that's a fraction of the money that's been stolen from councils since 2010 is now being kind of given back to them, as if it's this is a great act of largesse. Um, I mean, I think this is one reason why the polls aren't moving. Is like the country is just visibly falling to bits, mm. um, and the Tories keep trying to sort of persuade people to come back with 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 tax cuts, but they can't get a GP appointment in there. And, you know, do you remember the the, 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 the rack problem in schools? Mm. All the I'm, school sure that, roof I'm sure that's been fixed. They yeah, that's now. fine now. We've stopped talking now. about that, so yeah. I assume that's gone away, right? If, but if just, the news isn't talking about it, it's fine now. They've knocked two points off national insurance. That's probably not going to make a big difference. They knocked another two points off literally four months ago. That made no difference. That's basically a four, uh, 4P four tax cut for working mm. people. That's quite a big deal. And nobody, as far as I can tell, outside Jeremy Hunt's office is expecting it to make a blind bit of difference to anything. Mm. Well, the overall tax burden is the highest amount since the late 1940s, um, after something very big had happened. I can't remember. I didn't look it up. <laughs> um, what would be, I'll start with you, John, what would be like a reasonable tax cut or tax reform? Like if you were a, if you were a better Chancellor of the Exchequer, where would you be looking um, to sort of fix the tax problem. I mean, like the reason the tax burden is high, even though like these these sort of headline tax cuts are being made, it is because of uh, the exciting phenomenon of fiscal drag. That's basically the phenomenon where like the, the rate at which you start paying higher taxes uh, has not moved in line with inflation. So as people have had inflationary pay rises, they've been pushed up into it's higher... the thresholds. Yeah, yeah, the thresholds. So like, I think like... If you actually kind of wanted to bear down on that tax threshold, that is what you would do. You would be raising the thresholds. Uh, and the reason uh, that's not happening is because there isn't actually any bloody money in the system. Chancellor Zoe, what would you uh, change? I mean, I would just have to agree with John, because um, partly because my actual I'm one of those terrible journalists who knows a lot about the politics, but not a lot about the economics. And fiscal drag is one of those statements that always um, makes me squirm a little bit. But yeah, I think I think John's absolutely spot on. Now, let's have a question from one of our Patreon backers in But Your Emails. If you support us on Patreon, you too can submit a question for the panel. This week, we have one that's uh, especially aimed at our guest, Mariana. Um, Stuart St. John asks, how did it feel to be singled out by Trump as a purveyor of fake news for being the creator of the suite of social media undercover voters? Um, referring to something. You'll probably have to explain this that you were doing for America. Oh, well, yes. I spend a lot of time, if anyone listening to this listens to America, repeating the same refrain that sounds a bit like the terms and conditions about the undercover voters. So for the context of that question, the undercover voters are five fictional characters that I created based on data from a US think tank, and they have social media profiles across all of the main platforms. And crucially, um, I use them to investigate what different people are being recommended and targeted with, um, but I don't you know, message real people or deceive anyone in any way other than kind of just testing the algorithms. Mm. But never did uh, Donald Trump Jr. let truth get in the way mm. of a good post on X, or it was Twitter at the time. So he did a post saying uh, something along the lines of, fake news, BBC, you've made these characters classic. You've proved yourselves to be. Um, and we've tried to get him on Americast lots of times, but unfortunately... <laughs> He's not replied to. Actually, actually, recently, um, 
Sarah Smith, who's the America editor at the BBC, did manage to, the US editor, did manage to chat to uh, one of Trump's sons um, very briefly. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, never to tell them who the undercover voters are. Um, it was it was very surreal because the article that was shared at the time was a picture of my face. And so I had lots of people I know sending me screen grabs of, Marina, have you seen? You're like on Donald Trump Jr.'s page and it's just you and I was like <laughs> I was like oh wow okay um and I did try and respond but he didn't respond either um so it was very surreal I, I I've also had the same thing happen with Elon Musk and several other people so it's, the novelty wears off unfortunately <laughs> and it triggers an awful lot of kind of other abusive messages um much more abusive than the initial message I was targeted by former professional footballer Jerry Barton on X I think it was last week and um again it's a very similar pattern which is someone will take aim at you and their message isn't explicitly abusive, but they're playing into particular ideas or tropes, often that are contrary to what's actually true. And then uh, it triggers this wave of what I often call the shock troops, these kind of anonymous mm. accounts, or not always anonymous, often not anonymous, who send you explicitly abusive messages. We're talking sort of death threats, rape threats, really nasty, extreme abuse. Um, and this cycle just happens all the time, really. I wonder who will be next. I don't know who I'd next like to tweet a picture of my face. Do you think these guys know that they're kind of like, you know, it's like a summoning spell. They're saying like, attack this person. Or do you think it's like totally incidental to the fact they just want to have a go? Um, I'd like to think that, I don't know, it's always hard. I mean, it's always hard to know what someone actually thinks because I don't think they'd ever say that that's why they do it. Um, I think ultimately a lot of this content will play into the committed followers they have mm. and they want them to respond and they want their engagement if the byproduct of that is them then sending out abuse that doesn't really matter i mean something i hear a lot and this is more when i'm interviewing you know your classic conspiracy theorists or they'll say oh well you know i can't help if someone behaved in a harmful or hurtful way just because i shared this my message wasn't abusive and you kind of have to question that question them on that issue of responsibility to what extent are you actually also responsible for the, the outcome of this. I, I've put this to quite a few of them, Joe Barton last week being one example, um, and he didn't respond to any of the points I put to him and then subsequently kind of did this, posted about me, and it exactly proved what mm. I had just mm. exposed in the podcast I was doing at the time. So often they kind of prove the same cycle happens. And on X, certainly, and I've spent a lot of time investigating the kind of evolution of what was Twitter and now X. Um, it's perhaps easier than ever to do that because you can buy a blue tick, your mm. messages have prominence. A lot of the people that follow you might have also decided to buy blue ticks now, their messages have prominence. And so that whole cycle is, I think, definitely mm. more, what's the right word, corrosive or um, more sort of potent than it was even one or two years ago. X, who never replied to my emails, would say <laughs> that they have lots of uh, policies in place to protect users and particularly users' voices, which they believe passionately in defending. Yeah, no, I've no, I've noticed. Um, <laughs> I would say, John, um, that they do. Of course, they know. I mean, I've had people. I've I've been at the end of pylons. Not not very many. Um, it, you know, it's all relatively sort of mild. But when and and not very famous people, except Jordan Peterson. Um, cool. Be the only <laughs> the only famous one, and um, and they of course they know because they do the quote tweet and they loop you in, and that sort of. I'm not saying they always do that, but a lot of the time it is intended. And maybe the first time you do it and you maybe put someone's face on there or whatever, and then you might go afterwards, oh my gosh, I didn't realise that would happen. And then, of course, you could always just send a message to the affected person and go, look, I'm really sorry. I didn't realise that. Oh, it's so terrible. I'll be more careful in the future. Weirdly, they don't do that and they continue to do it. And I think the old sort of when you've got a lot of followers, the old quote tweet trick mm. is sort of deniability. It's just like, I'm just drawing attention to something. If my many ardent fans <laughs> then decide to attack this person, mm. that's why well, I didn't see that coming. And I just think, come on now. Mm. Actually, on that point as well, um, I've had it happen recently where a big account has taken aim at me and I do that thing where you remove yourself. So even though your name is tagged, you're not getting all the notifications, which is which is quite a good guard against mm. getting trolled. And they've kept tagging me and they keep saying, why do you keep untagging yourself? You're not replying. Like, Stop <laughs> sending me these messages. I don't want them. It's almost <laughs> it's like you don't like, want your hate mail. <laughs> oh, it's so weird that I don't want to just sit here and consume your messages. <laughs> Thank you, though. In the second half of the show, we are talking to Mariana about her new book, Among the Trolls, My Journey Through Conspiracy Land, how conspiracy theories are changing our politics and what it's like to cover people who do not take criticism well. 
So, Mary, you became the BBC's disinformation and social media correspondent in March 2020. Um, it's quite a busy month for the world. Um, it was. <laughs> what led you to that job? Were you kind of particularly fascinated by one you know, part of that? Yeah, so... Um... My uh, my trolls who get far too much of a shout out at the moment in this podcast <laughs> um, uh, love to say, ha ha, the BBC knew that the COVID-19 pandemic was coming and they made this job and it's all part of the plan. But unfortunately, that was not the case. So I started doing this job just before the pandemic, but actually with a view to covering the US election, which was happening at the end of that year. Mm. Um, and prior to that, I'd done um, a lot of sort of social media investigating around the 2019 general election, which had just happened at that point. Um, and I think there was this kind of widespread recognition that it would be value, valuable from a public service point of view to have a dedicated reporter who covers and reports on this stuff. And if you look over to America in particular, in the States, there are quite a lot of dedicated reporters working for all kinds of organisations, CNN, NBC, New York Times, who investigate and cover this mm. stuff. So um, it was this kind of recognition, right, OK, I think maybe we should have someone to cover this too. And it's different from tech journalism in so much as it really kind of gets into the sort of sociology bit of it all, like the way it affects society and and democracies and how our societies function, essentially. Um, and I've always been really interested in, I think, social media, maybe because I grew up, I was like, I got Instagram when I was 14. Um, I sort of was that kind of cohort of people who grew up with social media when it was first a thing and um, the kind of social media as we know it now, although even now I think that feels that feels different and I'm not actually that old. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it it... That was what kind of drew me towards it, this this area and this job. I also studied Russian. I was really interested in propaganda. I, the 2016 election, right. I was at university and it was when everything happened with, um, you know, allegations of foreign influence and all that kind of stuff. And so I was always, always quite interested in sort of allegations about bots and inauthentic behaviour and... And that, and so that's kind of what led me, I guess, led me here eventually. Knowing um, Russian has come in very handy. I think. It is very yeah. handy. Yeah, it's very handy. It also is another thing that people love to be like, she's a spy. I'd be such a bad spy. <laughs> are, are you a spy? <laughs> I am not a spy. Mm. Um, I'd be a very bad spy, genuinely. Just what spy? Just what spy would say. It's <laughs> a good question, John. I'm not yeah. Yeah. That well. I'm really getting to the heart. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's. No, good. I always I miss say that. I'm I'm very good at finding things out and telling them to people, and I'm not very good at finding things out and keeping them a secret. So, <laughs> so I am not going. This is the last mention for the trolls. Um, but I did wonder, uh, reading the book, when you took on the job, knowing this sort of area, like how much of this were you prepared for? That's a really good question. Um, I think I always knew, particularly because, you know, you find yourself, like one of the first stories I ever did really of my own original reporting at the BBC was, it was the 2019 European elections and it was all about death threats and hate in Facebook groups. Um, and I think, you know, from that point, and that was before I started this job, I was quite aware of the level of hate that accompanies or disinformation in general and the kinds of stuff I'd be investigating. And so I knew that I would become a lightning rod to some extent. I don't think I probably realised like, how much of a lightning rod <laughs> I'd become. Um, and I remember my, the first ever pylon I experienced was about a couple of months in and I'd been investigating something to do with QAnon, which is that mm. sprawling US conspiracy theory. And um, that I, I feel like I should tell everyone what it is. It's that sprawling US conspiracy theory, um, which suggests that Donald Trump has been waging the secret war against elite pedophiles in business and government and media and everywhere else. And anyway, I suddenly got like, I started getting all these messages and I just never experienced anything like it. And I was like, what is going on? And I was sitting on my Twitter and you're just getting like notification after notification. Um, and at that time, that was, yeah, that was the first time I'd ever experienced it. Now I am so used to that. It's like, oh, yes. I, in fact, and that's the thing is you factor it in now. It's like right. any investigation I do, any, my book, anything, we factor in, right, there will be, um, you know, it will make me more of a lightning rod and they will attack every kind of everything they can think of and willfully misconstrue things. And to some extent, you have to just, I the thing I like best is seeing it as, exactly what I'm exposing in the first place. Like, this is how these tactics work. And they are, I think, essentially sort of tactics of intimidation. They're attempting to sort of take aim at you and to stop you doing the journalism you do. Mm. Um, and that's one of the things that I actually really hate about it because I would hate people, particularly like young women or anyone looking to become journalists, to think, oh, this is, this is the price mm. of doing... And I do a very particular type of journalism in a very sort of spiky world yeah. um, and I think it is I think it is just sort of the cost of it and it's exactly what I'm exposing in the first place so of course it happens um, but I think it's a pretty sinister thing when a lot of these people champion freedom of expression as 
you know, a cornerstone of their belief system that like a young investigative journalist can get, you know, repeatedly ab abused. And we're talking really extreme abuse and then also harassed in person, you know, targeted outside work, stuff like that, which I think if it was happening anywhere else, we'd all be like, wow, that's really bad. But when mm. it happens here, we're kind of like, oh, it's, oh, oh, they just believe something that's a bit, it's a bit unusual. <laughs> Has it rendered social media completely unusable <laughs> in sort of a normal way? Like, yeah. can you still like chat to people there or is it just, just endless abuse? No, so I, I still can. And actually the reason I use it, I mean, A, is because I investigate social media. So of course I want to use it. Um, and I often compare it to, you know, like a political journalist. Imagine if you couldn't go in like the House of Commons, uh, you couldn't go in the Houses of Parliament or you couldn't be in the space that you're covering. So I always want to try and stay there. I get so many brilliant messages from people who want me to investigate their stories. And I still get those lots. And they are very much a kind of, motivator they motivate a lot of the reporting I do and I love hearing from them and they're often people who otherwise feel like no one is listening to them like the social media companies aren't the authorities mm. aren't politicians aren't and so it's absolutely the reason I do this job to investigate their stories and that's why I stay in these places so they can contact me um but there is I mean particularly on x right now I x is really hard mm. I find x really hard to use now um and uh there is it's hard to move for the trolls. Whereas I think on the other social media sites, there's still that kind of balance of like still the trolling, but the real people can get in touch. Yeah. I think on X, that's, that's changed significantly, actually. As a as a young woman, um, obviously, I can imagine that you would you probably feel like you're subject to even more kind of trolling and probably quite personal trolling. I mean, do you get a sense that it is a lot worse for young women or minorities because there's a sense that they have less come back and that they have kind of, you know, that they're an easier target? Or is it just a kind of natural thing for any journalist now that you can expect some sort of social media pile on? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, I'm I'm very lucky that I don't receive racist hate or homophobic hate or other forms of discrimination that I could. And I know lots of other journalists or other people who receive that kind of abuse. Um, and it's really horrible. Um, I think that you know, a lot of the abuse I get is very gendered. Mm -hmm. um, so it will talk about me being either a kind of like silly sort of like puppet woman <laughs> who's only 28 and of course she can't know what she's talking about. Or I'm like an evil satanic like whore who's going to eat everyone. And, you know, it's like either end of the pick, spectrum. Pick, pick, pick a lane. Pick, pick a lane. Both. You know, yeah. you can't be both. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it is very gendered, gendered slurs, all that kinds of stuff. Um, I, I do think that there's also a kind of concerted attempt to sort of undermine my journalism, my credibility all the time when that doesn't happen to quite so much. Or it does happen to some some men who work in this field as well, but it doesn't seem to happen in quite as concerted mm. of a way. It's quite hard to compare because I do such a specific job investigating such a kind of nasty online world. And I do it for the BBC, who also are you know, frequently targeted mm. um, in this way. Um, and often people kind of see me like the complaints person, which I always find slightly hilarious. I'm like, I investigate bad stuff on social media. I had nothing to do with this. And they'll be tagging, Mariana, Mariana, what are you going to do about this? I'm like, this has literally got nothing to do with me. I want to be like, my job is this. Um, so yeah, I do think I do think it's a part of it. Um, I, I think the other, the other element is that I really like to like get involved. I don't want to just sit in you know, sit on, on my phone or on my laptop. I want to be like out there meeting these people, asking them difficult questions, trying to understand what's going on. And that very act of kind of taking the audience with you and investigating this world makes you even more of a lightning rod because you're actually a person mm. and they don't want to attack like the BBC to some extent or even, you know, like Panorama or Radio 4 or whatever. They're like faceless brands. Mm. Whereas you're like a person whose face is on it, often on the picture or on the, you know, and so you are, and that is, I think, what engages the audience, which I love. But the very thing that makes people love it is the same thing that makes the troll-esque type people hate it. So I love the concept of conspiracy land, um, which is sort of akin to um, Naomi Klein in Doppelgang. She talks about mirror world. Yeah, and yeah. it's this idea of like, almost like a physical space. And I noticed that when George Galloway won Rochdale, the label left wing, even maverick left wing, controversial left wing, just didn't really seem to cover these sort of strange alliances and these strange beliefs um, and this almost sort of new, new thing, which is beyond left and right. And it's just conspiracy theorists. Do you think that the mainstream, the mainstream reporters, um, sort of might need to sort of catch up a bit with with how you define these people politically when it seems that they slide between kind of like new age, you know, challenging authority and the far right and they seem to converge in very odd ways. Yeah, I think um, 
I think you're totally right to point out, kind of in particular, and I find this a lot, how people who are very involved in conspiracy land often position themselves sort of entirely outside or they perceive themselves as being entirely outside of the political system, even if they have views or ideas that actually align with, you know, one ideology or another. Um, I think there is, I think there has been a problem with, in general, the mainstream media sort of not knowing quite what to do with this stuff. And like before Mm. my job existed, and even at the start when my job existed, there was this real squeamishness about, should we talk about it? Should we not talk about it? Are we going to make it worse? Are we going to amplify it? Are we not? What do we do? Um, And I think that it's really, for me, there are kind of two important bars. One is thinking about how viral something is, how many people it's reached and Mm. investigating it for that reason. The other is the real world harm it can cause. And I think when it comes to politics in particular, some of this discourse and conversation and stuff different, you know, but MPs or candidates endorse can have a really real world impact and it can, you know, and and conspiracy land perhaps in some ways, like conspiracy land is talking about the most extreme stuff, but a lot of the stuff that people will encounter kind of sits on that like border between mm. reality and conspiracy land. And that's what you find particularly in the mainstreaming of conspiracy ideas. And I think that's actually some of the hardest stuff to deal with because often someone someone is saying something that has, you know, this grain of truth to it, or it's not like totally extreme, or it's not like totally untrue, but there's something, it's sort of flirting with the language of conspiracy land and the ideas. And I think that's what the media in general has struggled a bit with because, and then and then you come to this, I've been talking about this quite a lot around um, the US election and sort of like fact-checking MPs or politicians or whoever and saying, you know, how valuable is it to basically kind of go, well, that's wrong. Well, that's wrong. Well, that's wrong. To what extent do people engage with that or do they just kind of think, I don't know, does it make a difference if someone, if a politician says something that's not true and you say, that's not true, does it really cut through? And I think one thing that's really helpful is to kind of think of it in two as a two-stage thing, which is this is not true and here's why you should care about the fact it's not true because it could do this or it could do that. And I hope that this election period, which is going to be a very busy one, will be one where people do that more because I do find that people are much more inclined to understand why they should be worried about a particular lie or a particular mistruth if they know actually how it could cause harm to them or other people around them. Well, I remember um, in the 90s when I was really interested in conspiracy theories, not as a, as a believer, but just as in them as a phenomenon, and they went, you know, by those standards, fairly mainstream, nothing like what they are now. And the general thing was this is a bit harmless. And I would go and interview, you know, the music press, some like drum and bass DJ with some pretty kind of wacky ideas. And I, yeah, this is going to be good copy. This is a bit of fun. Um, and now, of course, if I heard those views, I was like, oh, Jesus, you know, this is the, the they'd probably be nastier. Plus, you would have guessed that there were other things beyond those. So I also wonder whether, particularly for a lot of older journalists, that, that, that it's quite hard to let go of that idea that conspiracy theorists are, you know, kind of harmless. harmless kooks. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that is a part of it as well. And I think that, like, to some extent, a lot of conspiracy theories sort of have been fairly harmless up until quite recently. Um, I think the difference is, is that the ones we're talking about are ones that sort of have an impact in real time. You know, it's like thinking that the pandemic was a hoax or staged or believing that... Um, Uh, climate change isn't real or, you know, all of these that it's being staged or part of this sinister plan, these actually could have kind of tangible impacts on on different groups of people, on individual lives, but also on society. And so I think it's recognising that real world harm, which is basically like what I spend all my time doing, that is the the reason for caring about this perhaps in a way or Mm. treating it in a different way to how we would have before. Um, And I think that it's a really positive thing that as I think in general, the media now is much more kind of savvy about actually, okay, this can be harmful and it can be a bad thing. Um, That doesn't necessarily stop it happening, but there are more people than ever. Like I was thinking about the difference between this election coming up in both the UK and the States and, you know, everywhere. (laughs) And then also um, the ones that happened, you know, back in 2019, 2020. And I do think that even more than before, there's this kind of like, army of people, whether it's like reporters like me, whether it's, um, you know, different kind of uh, open source investigators or fact checkers who exist. And then also, you know, all journalists who cover all areas, like Mm. often come across this in different ways. I think the more that just in general, we accept that this is a kind of expertise that we all benefit from having, the better it is for the general public, I hope. And as we said, your, your job sort of coincided you taking that job coincided with the first COVID lockdown pretty much. QAnon was, was sort of up and running. There were a lot, of, a lot of things sort of happening at once. Why do you think the pandemic supercharged 
conspiracy land in the way that it did. I think one thing, so one one thing that often, uh, I remember this during COVID, the kind of conspiracy activists would say to me, it's like, you must love lockdown. Like, you love the pandemic. So I absolutely hated the pandemic, for the record. <laughs> it was terrible. And I'm sure, no I'm sure that everybody here, here yeah. also hated the pandemic. So why did you create it? <laughs> <laughs> Again, just a little John side hobby. The best <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah. Basically, I often, I've, I've, yeah, I've often thought this is like, it was absolutely terrible. And because it was absolutely terrible and rubbish and everyone was stuck at home and life was just really uncertain. And I think it's kind of difficult to remember just how sort of scary it was in those first few weeks. It was really scary. You were like, what's going to happen? Like, where, mm. like, I don't know. You just didn't know what was going to happen, basically. It was totally, and to use the cliched, unprecedented, but it really was for us. And so I think that um, that really helps me to understand how people got fell down the rabbit hole in the way they did because it was just this huge moment of uncertainty. They were isolated from people and social media became this really valuable tool in some ways because it was like the only way to connect with people. Mm. Um, it was unprecedented and people were looking for answers and it was really hard to make sense of and people wanted to know if they were going to be okay and their families were going to be okay. And so they went out looking looking for some kind of quick fix, I guess, and then they very quickly descended into conspiracy theory suggesting this was staged and it didn't happen um and then this whole kind of conspiracy theory movement in the uk converged and i think it wouldn't be fair to say that it didn't exist before i think elements of it de definitely did but it just kind of joined everyone up together and you know this movement gave people purpose and agency and reason i mean i used to i used to think it quite a lot when i i'd go and cover the anti-lockdown rallies that were happening and there were some people there with legitimate concerns worries um, about restrictions and whether they were legitimate but there were quite a lot of Hardcore conspiracy theory signs, mm. lots of Bill Gates, who is a real sort of character of the conspiracy theory movement. Perhaps the most boring man ever to become <laughs> know, like a supervillain. Yes, yeah, proper supervillain. You wouldn't cast him in a movie. <laughs> no, no. And, it, you know, this idea was going to kill millions of people and and he was deliberately setting out to do that and everything else. Different from legitimate, again, legitimate debates about vaccine patents or other things we could mm. talk about. Um, and um, at those rallies, I remember thinking it quite well. It was when it was like, peak lockdown, particularly that really difficult lockdown, the one that was the kind of January 2021. And I was like, I think everyone just like wants to get out of the house. Mm. <laughs> like you had that feeling of like, everyone just wants to sort of like be able to be out and about and stuff to be back to normal. But I think the problem is, is that after COVID, that didn't happen. And a lot of people I speak to said, oh, I really thought my friend or my next door neighbour or my parent or whoever would come out of this rabbit hole. But they didn't. Right, because yeah. once you fundamentally believe that uh, these kind of superhuman capabilities you're you're prescribing you're, you're prescribing to all kinds of people. Once you fundamentally believe that people are capable of like staging a whole pandemic, what else could they stage? Mm. And I do think you could see how genuinely terrified you'd be if you think, "Wow, this is what happened." And separate from you know real examples of where politicians broke rules, or um, you know there were examples of where debate about decisions made in terms of pandemic restrictions. You know, this is this is people who've now just gone so deep into this topsy-turvy world that they can't get out. And there was a moment I, I interviewed this conspiracy theory newspaper editor. And there was a moment we were having this back and forth. And I had that, mo I just, I said to him, I was like, look, you and I, the problem here is that like we can all be looking at this black table in front of us. I might love it. You guys might hate it, but we agree the table is there. If the table isn't there or you don't think the table's mm. there, we can't talk about the table mm. and we basically can't have a conversation anymore. And that's what's happened to quite a lot of people who are still down the rabbit hole very much. Is there a reason to think this will get better? Because it does seem to have been getting worse for a number of years, but it, it feels to me like we have been through, but that you can see comparable moments in history where like, you know, the arrival of a new medium kind of messes everything up politically and then things move on again. What does what does moving on look like? What, please tell me this doesn't go on forever. I also hope it doesn't go on forever, mainly because I think I would be very exhausted <laughs> if it did. Um, I think that we're still very much in the sort of thick of this period of time. Um, I think that... that I also thought that too, actually. I kind of thought, right, COVID-19, the pandemic's going to ease up, restrictions will ease up, and then maybe everything will settle down a bit. But actually, you know, whether it's wars or whether it's um, uh, terror attacks or you know, anything bad that happens in the news, I, I often watch this. I watch the headlines and I think, right, okay, there's going to be, that person's going to be accused of being a crisis actor or that person's going to be, which is someone being paid to act out a tragedy, or that person's going to be accused of who knows what, staging the most terrible day of their life. Um, I think that 
fundamentally, this is about the social media companies. Um, and I think you're right that there have been examples, you know, a bit like when radio was first a thing where there's this proliferation of like all sorts and then everyone kind of settles down and works out how to regulate it and it calms down. Um, with social media companies, I think the difficulty is, is that like, like I think we should treat social media companies like we do governments. Um, they are as powerful, if not more powerful than lots of governments all around the world. And yet the level of accountability and transparency is incredibly low. I mean, I last year, I obviously sent, you know, sent right of reply, putting allegations to the social media companies on many occasions. I did not do a single interview with anybody, a, a boss or a, mm. anyone in charge at a social media company. I did speak to insiders, but not people who were speaking on behalf of that company and ready to be held to account and ready to be transparent. And I think until, you know, I always say this, I'm I'm an investigative reporter and I'm not a campaigner, but until there is some shift in, I think, the way that the social media companies work. And you know, some of this comes down to the fundamental product, right? Which is like the way that the platforms work, what they reward and don't reward, what they recommend you and don't re recommend you is a part of this. And as lots of insiders from the companies have told me on many many occasions, there is no incentive for the companies to overhaul those models because they make way less money. They would say, which I should say, the, the, all these nameless social media companies, that that you know that's not the priority that they they care about user safety far more than profit. Um, but I think until there's a real moment of, I don't know, if reckoning is the right word, but a real moment of, and and I don't think the online safety bill is necessarily that, but at least it is a kind of public understanding about that. Um, I think that will, it, it will continue to be a problem. And I think particularly with all the elections and everything coming up, I can't see it, unfortunately, improving in the short term, but maybe in the long term. Well, one of the big themes thought. of your book, and perhaps why it isn't likely to change for the, for the better without some kind of concerted action, is something relatively new, which is sort of the industrialization of conspiracy theories and how profitable they are to, you know, the guy who's sort of selling DVDs from a market stall about the way the world really works, you know, to the social media companies, to somebody like Alex Jones. Generally, there are a lot of people making money out of this in a way that before you might have somebody that, that you know, wrote a book about JFK and, you know, got a nice advance, but there wasn't this whole kind of network. And is that what is is that one of the big problems? Is there's just a lot of people where they're, they're just making money hand over fist? Yeah, I think that's a big driver of this, particularly for the people who I often separate out the kind of true believers, the followers that I've been talking about quite a lot from the non-believers, question mark, who are the people who often more cynically will promote these ideas. And they're able to do it, um, you know, they're able to grow a following, make money. And we're not necessarily talking, you know, Alex Jones levels of, millions of dollars or billions of dollars um, from selling products alongside promoting conspiracy theories. But we are talking about people being able to make a living, basically, mm -hmm. um, and being able to have, you know, some devoted fans and followers and committed people. And that's kind of how this works right now, which is you, you don't need millions of followers. You just need enough people to, you know, turn up at your events or listen to what you have to say or, or watch your videos or whatever else to actually generate a bit of a decent bit of income. And so I think that that does play a big part. And I think until those people are not able to kind of benefit in that way, and I, I was saying this to someone earlier, I was like, can you imagine in primary schools, people will start saying like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I'd like to be a teacher. Oh, I'd actually love to be a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> <laughs> um, my old rumble channel. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. But it kind of is. It's like, and, and a lot of that is like the, the influencer model, I guess, which is like the ability to make a living from social media, which, you know, is positive for lots of people and allows them to make money. But the, the negative of that is people that are able to make money and become influencers in mm. a bad, harmful way. Um, and, you know, the social media companies won't want to change that model because it's why lots of people use their platforms and it's all to do with advertisers and everything else. So how do you really solve that? For me, there's not an obvious solution. Well, like the conspiracy theorists say, follow the money. I know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, that's exactly, exactly the case. All of the phrases, by the way, in conspiracy land, you can totally use <laughs> the other way around. So well, like, no, follow the money. Yes, exactly. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm doing. They'll be like, no who's paying you? And you'll be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm being paid by the overlords. Uh, and then uh, um, also things like do your own research, which is one of the favourite catchphrases. Yeah, and it's a, do do your, yeah, I do my own research, do your own research. I'd love for people to do their own research more. Um, but they kind of blindly follow some of the followers in particular, who I do actually see as victims in, in this as well. They will blindly follow someone who is misleading them for their benefit. And I think by exposing the money and the benefit, that is a really useful thing because people can realise that they're being like conned essentially or scammed mm. by some of these people. Mariana's book, Among the Trolls, is out now.
And that's the show. Thanks to John. Thank you. Zoe. Thank you. And our guest, Mariana Spring. Thank you for having me. Stick around for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and a shout out to our generous supporters. Your help is keeping us going in these trying economic times more than Jeremy Hunt. Mm -hmm. We know life is increasingly expensive for everyone. So whatever you can contribute, whether it's three pounds a month or a little bit more, is truly appreciated. Search Oh God What Now Patreon to find out how you can help. Hello and thanks from me to brand new supporters Stuart Anthony, uh, Jack Nickel and LJ. And a big thank you and welcome to the Oh God What Now secret army to Gideon Calder, T. Thakar and Tom McEnroe. And thanks for your support to F. Cowery, Tina and JCD. Mm-hmm.